Step one, take a hammer to the bathroom scale. Step two, rip up all the diet rule books. And step three, get ready to redefine what health and well being means to you. And guess what? It's not your weight, it's not your shape, and it's not how much space you take up. Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield. I'm the author of the book, Body Kindness, and host for this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I ask that you keep an open mind as we have interesting conversations about what it means in this culture to resist and reject and divest from the norms of health is only for people who are pursuing thinness and weight loss and dieting. We can say no to that. That does not help many people create a better life. But through this show and our conversations, I am confident that you will find your own meaningful path to a happier and healthier life. Even if you want things to change, that's okay. But we have a whole lot of unlearning to do, and I invite you to join me on the unlearning. The tools to help you get started with body kindness are here and they are free. Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash start. Give your name and email and you'll get instant access. You'll also get some email check-ins from me. Hear a little bit of the backstory about how body kindness came to be, um, what other readers and listeners are saying that have helped them. And um, you'll even get a free chapter from the book. The book is available wherever you get your books and audiobooks. I would love for you to check that out. Uh, We'll invite you to the Facebook group. There's a self-reflection guide and many more perks. So again, that's bodykindnessbook.com slash start. And real quick for my helping professionals, I'd like you to check out bodykindnessbook.com slash learn and grow. That is where you can get information about my online mentor program. It's application-based, and um, we are building a wait list right now for it for the 2019 to 2020 year. This is a 10-month program. It involves live chats, private one-on-ones with me. We've got guest experts, lots of fascinating topics that are really going to help you build out a body kindness practice, whether you do counseling, coaching, uh, training, as long as you're a helping professional. This includes educators too, especially if you're in physical ed or health ed. I really want to help you learn and grow and help make your communities happier, healthier, stronger, and braver. And that's at any size. Again, bodykindnessbook.com slash learn and grow and add your name to the wait list. You'll be the first to know about early applications and all the other goodness coming your way. My mad woman is uh, Teka from Moana, the lava monster. So she starts throwing lava balls at me like you have failed. So I take my own advice from the book. I like sit quietly. I turn toward the lava monster who is enraged at me. And I ask her, like, talk to me. Tell me what's going on for you. I have crossed the horizon to find you. (laughs) I know your name. Moana does this too. She's like, I'm not afraid of you. They have stolen the heart from inside you. It's not her fault that she's crazy. But this does not define you. (laughs) This is not who you are. You know who you are. You are. Yeah. So that was less than 15 seconds. Absolutely fair use. So I turn toward her and she starts telling me how like when I make these errors, people are going to hate me and resent me and realize I'm not a professional. I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm going to die alone, literally. And when I can listen with kindness and compassion in this way, literally like Moana turning toward Teka, holding, she's holding Teka's heart in the palm of her hand. We hold the heart of our own worst enemy right there in the palm of our hand. And if we can turn toward her with kindness and compassion, 
she will start telling us like what my lava monster started telling me, which is not just that I was going to die alone, but how afraid she was for me, how important it was for me that she keep me safe and how tired she was from working so hard all the time to make the world think that I am, you know, perfect. Not that the world thinks that, but like working so hard to put on a show to make it seem like I never make mistakes. That was Emily and Amelia Nagoski. They are the co-authors of a new important book called Burnout. It's all about exactly what you would think, stress, getting burnt out, um, and some really interesting underlying reasons for why we, especially women, struggle and what we can do about it. Now, this is the second part of our interview. So if you missed part one, after you're done with this, be sure to go back and listen to part one um, so you get the full picture of our conversation. In this part two, we are going to discuss um, the new hotness and what that's all about. I absolutely love what we talk about in the sense of it's not about striving, you know, to be hot. It's about reframing your relationship with yourself to realize that you already are what you want to be, especially when it comes to how we look at beauty and appearance and shape and worthiness. And it's just a really important perspective shifting. It's something that I deeply believe um, and my personal values, what I'm trying to teach my own two daughters and what I really wish we could all begin to see, not just for ourselves, but for all people. And then we get into a really interesting conversation about the mad woman in the attic. Uh, you might recognize from body kindness as your inner critic or Miss Perfectionist and how you can change your relationship to the mad woman um, to bounce back from burnout. So um, once again, if you're not familiar with Emily and Amelia, Emily is a sex educator and author of Come As You Are, The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life. And as a personal testimonial, it has transformed mine. So if you have any difficulties with body image and sexuality, that is your book. I love the audiobook. Can't say enough great things about it. What Emily does as a profession is she travels all over the world. She trains therapists, medical professionals, college students, and the general public about the science of women's sexual well-being. And Amelia Nagoski has a doctorate of musical arts. She's an assistant professor and coordinator of music at Western New England University. And so her job is to run around waving her arms and making funny noises and generally doing whatever it takes to help singers get in touch with their internal experience. And as you can tell, we've got some singing going on in this episode. It was so much fun uh, to talk to these women. And I really hope that you get a lot out of this episode and um, you could start to help yourself shift perspective, kind of find a better way to manage your stress and self-care. It's not always what we, we think it is, right? So it's not always about bubble bath, solve everything or you know, go wash your face and it will all be fine. It really has to do with a sense of how we can deal with our stress and enhance our own well-being, but also remember the powerful need to build a community of um, women who care, give for each other and share in responsibility for our care and well-being. Please, if you can support the show, that would be um, very, very much appreciated. It helps to cover production costs. And I'm always going to make this show independent, away from as many ads as possible. So listener support is key. And you can get that link at gofundme.com slash bodykindness. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. And it's no coincidence, chapter three is Mm -hmm. about meaning and being part of something larger because we definitely wanted this book about burnout and quote unquote Mm self-care to be connected to an entire universe of people who are caring for each other so that when you start to attend to your own needs in a way that that starts to eliminate human giver syndrome and you learn to become a human giver who is surrounded by other givers and is protected from the toxic messages of human beings, 
as you start to turn toward that internally, it gives you energy and ability to see where it is needed around you. And coincidentally, when you feel like you are a part of something larger, mm -hmm. that connectedness is actually really good for you and can be a source of burnout prevention. Yeah. A personal testimonial to that experience. I've never felt like that I've been a more capable clinician until I actually stopped doing everything weight loss dieting and became a member of ASDA and learned about health at every size. And, and I'm definitely, I'm always going to be learning and growing, but that sense of knowing that there, that there was a better way to do work and to have values and stand for them, it, it really is like, it changes your life for the better and it's okay to be uncertain. Well, I just feel like I have so many things, you know, just to be at a place where you can be in an open mind and listening, you know, can be one meaningful action that's going to lead to more. Absolutely. And once you find that discovery or make that turn towards something larger than yourself, mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who's found a moment like that where they really felt universally connected and of service to something where they felt like they were done now. Oh, I discovered it and now I'm done. <laughs> what that leads to is a perspective that increases your curiosity, that increases your interest in what else can I see around me and what more is there that I can do and what other people are there who need help, who I can reach out to now that I'm here in this place of capability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that and nothing really helps you help others you care about than your own going through it yourself, right? Because it's, it's your best teacher. Absolutely. There's a, a section in chapter two. So the whole first section, there's three sections of the book. And the mm -hmm. first section we call uh, what you take with you, which is that's where Amelia does the yoga Yoda voice. <laughs> Only what you take with you. It's not a good Yoda voice, but I try. <laughs> it's I something. love it. I love it. It's staying in this edit. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's about the resources that you carry with you into the struggle. And one of them is the capacity of your body to complete the stress response cycle. And we don't just mean physical activity. There's at least eight evidence-based strategies for completing the cycle only one of which is physical activity. The second one is this thing we call the monitor, which is about the mechanism in your brain that governs your effort toward a goal. And one of the things we say right in the beginning there is that having there be like no gap between the world you live in and the world you want to live in, that's not the goal. That's not a natural, normal state of being. There will always be a difference between the world you live in and the world you want to live in. What helps us to stay sane and feel satisfied is knowing that that gap is normal, learning to live with it. And in fact, the, you know, principal social justice leaders of our, of the last 200 years are people who have seen the biggest gap between where we are and what is possible. They knew they would not live to see the ultimate resolution, like their vision of what the world could be would never come. And learning to like be comfortable in just like taking steps toward that is really important. And the reason why the third resource you bring into this fray is a connection with something larger than yourself and which something larger that is, is going to vary from person to person. My something larger, this is Emily, my something larger is teaching women to live with confidence and joy inside their bodies. Amelia's is just art. As simple as that. When you spend time connected with your something larger, then you know that the time you spent engaged in that work was movement toward the world as you know it could be. And you don't have to feel frustrated that the world isn't here yet because you know you are doing what your body is able to do to push the world toward what you long and envision it to be. Well, I long envision a world where there is no longer a bikini industrial complex. Hallelujah. Let's blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I'd love for you to share because I, every day, we could talk about it every day and we're still going to be talking about it because somebody new is going to be coming to the table and just, this is going to be the eye opener. So what is the bikini industrial complex and why is it so bad? The bikini industrial complex is a phrase, this is Amelia, that I, it came pouring out of my mouth in a rehearsal one day. 
because I had a room full of college students, mostly um, women in their late teens and early 20s, and I could not convince them that they needed to relax their abdominal muscles to allow themselves to breathe. They even consciously knew and kind of wanted to do what I was asking them to do with relaxing their abdomen so they can expand when they inhale and then contract when they exhale, which is how breathing works. They were all really convinced deep down in their muscles that your stomach is supposed to be hard and flat and that if it's not, then you're a, a failure of a human being. And so when I asked them to breathe, it's like I was asking them to give up on being a person who deserves love. Uh, so I needed to unbrainwash them for a minute to tell them there's this bikini industrial complex, this huge conglomeration of corporations, all kinds of businesses, and also government lobbyists, which has been successful. And so it actually reaches into the government. This is a government sanctioned mind control problem mm -hmm. that's trying to tell you that you're supposed to have abs of steel. And that's a fucking lie. I'm sorry. Can I swear? Yeah, I love swears. <laughs> it's a, it's a lie and it's dangerous for you and it stops you from being able to actually breathe. And if you can't breathe, well, you sure as hell can't smash the patriarchy. So the phrase bikini industrial complex came pouring out of my mouth uh, in that context of trying to explain to my students why I need them right now, right here in my classroom to start being aware of what they really believe is true about their bodies and what they have been told by sources that may or may not be credible is supposed to be true about their bodies. And to take this moment to turn their attention to the possibility that maybe their abdominal muscles are supposed to expand and contract and oscillate through the different states of being that they're capable of. And maybe the more you learn to expand and contract, the more breath you can take in, the more breath you can let out, the more possibility of what you can express with your voice and with your whole self. So that's where the bikini industrial complex came from. I love, I love the idea that was in a music class and in a singing class about how to, how to work with your body and use your body for, in a way that it's designed. Yes. And, and then sort of compare it to, I mean, how many messages today have we seen that was upheld by the beauty industrial complex, right? Any um, ad? <laughs> I went to the drugstore, therefore uncountable messages. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I tell my students, singing is a bodily function. Uh, it happens in your body. It is your heart and your mind and your spirit and the, all the art you make. But all the art you make is made of who you are. So mm -hmm. we end up talking about their bodies all the time. We begin with a physical warm-up that sends their attention to the weight of their bodies pressing into the floor um, or into their chairs or whatever, you know, where however they happen to be in the room that moment, um, and attending to their muscles and their bones and noticing tension that they can let go of. Absolutely. The process of singing and being in the world are the same. Being a really excellent citizen, being a really uh, powerful social justice advocate, everything it takes to be good at those things. Being are this, a good parent. Be, are, being a fantastic parent are the same things that are required when you sing. Mindfulness and presence and openness and generosity and also attending to your needs and feeling in a calm, balanced state. The fourth of our four steps to <laughs> contradicting the bikini industrial complex, which is the flu. Can we talk about solutions? Because I feel like when we talk about the bikini industrial complex, it gets real dark real yeah. fast. Yeah. Because we're so like, we're, we are trapped in it. Yeah. Our, our own family of origin reinforced it really strongly in us. Um, and we've had to work hard to find strategies and like, I've read a bunch of research and we've practiced a lot of things and we found four practices that can help you live even in the midst of bikini industrial complex and begin to undo it in your brain and in your family and in your circle of your bubble of love. Um, the first one we call the new hotness and Amelia can tell the new hotness story. Okay. Um, so uh, as a musician, I've actually had a little bit more practice with the sort of body self-acceptance than Emily has. Oh, Emily yeah. <laughs> struggles more than I do even now. One of the first things I had to do when I started studying conducting was video myself standing and waving my arms around and making faces at my choir and watching these videos back and reflecting on what a good job I did or what things I want to do better next time. So I've been watching myself on video for decades and that's mere exposure to my own body sort of desensitized me to what I might have perceived as flaws and made it easier for me to watch myself in the mirror or on television or wherever. So 
When I was shopping one day for a gown to wear for a performance, I found one and I took a picture in the dressing room and sent it to Emily. And uh, I texted a paraphrase from Men in Black 2 uh, that Will Smith says, I am the new hotness. Uh, He says, I'm the new hotness. And Tommy Lee Jones is old and busted. Anyway, I said, I'm the new hotness. And uh, Emily, it made Emily laugh. And so she uh, started trying it too, like looking in the mirror and going, new hotness. Okay, new hotness. Um, in my pajamas. <laughs> and it's just our shorthand for redefining beauty that is that does not have reference from the culturally constructed ideal. We're not saying that hot is what beauty or hot is what bodies ought to be, mm-hmm. but that hot is what bodies already are. They're beautiful the day they're born, and that beauty does not go away no matter what changes occur. The body itself is still beautiful and learning to see it takes practice. So new hotness is a game we play to practice. Yeah, I I love that because it is like our frames for how we see ourselves are also culturally constructed. They're familial, right? Same, you know, the the beauty, you know, going on and off diets with my mom was definitely a a hobby that I had developed in my lifetime as well. So can I, since you've never interviewed twins before, I'll also add that one of the uh, culturally constructed things around twins (laughs) is the idea of the fat twin. Fat twin. Yeah. Really? Um, Tell me more. That's just a thing that exists in the world. And I guess when you're twins, you pay attention to which one of you is the fat twin. Uh, And uh, if you looked at us now, I think you'd actually be hard pressed to tell, like, if there was one of us that was the fat twin. But for most of our lives, I was the fat twin, and I was the one who ended up watching myself on video and unlearning the the self critical automatic response to my appearance, even though I had actually learned it even more deeply than Emily did. Yeah. So it was just put the, put there, like in addition to everything else, it was put there in front of your yeah. face it's like, that I'm we're going to put a judgment on one of you. Yeah. yeah. It's like walking around in the world with, I'm the before picture and she's the after. Man. Like, except of course my experience wasn't that, mm-hmm. uh, we, there's always like labeling that happens, mm-hmm. even if it only happens in your own body. And this, for all I know, this happens with like regular siblings too. But when you're twins, it's like one of you is the smart one. One of you is the pretty one. One of you is the arty one. One of you is the sporty one. One of you is the feminine one. One of you is the masculine one. You get sort of cast in these roles. Um, And as an adolescent, it's hard not to like feed into those and buy into them and like make them even more true. So we've had a whole lot of unlearning the ways that we got cast. Mm -hmm. And what it sounds like to me is like labels (laughs) suck, right? The labels suck. And so when I say I'm the new hotness, Mm -hmm. what I'm doing is there's like, uh, I'm reclaiming where it's like, I get to label this. I get to say what I want to resist and how I see myself. Exactly. Lindy West talks about it in Shrill, just asking yourself the question, what if I just decided that I am worthy as I am, that Mm -hmm. I, that I'm beautiful as I am, that I deserve love just as I am. She says it may be more expressively and articulately than I'm um, paraphrasing, but you get the idea. And she also talks about deliberately exposing herself to images of bodies that she has been taught to reject. Yeah. Uh, and that, that mere exposure, just seeing those images, he says, expose yourself to these images until they don't make you uncomfortable anymore. Just look at different kinds of bodies until it feels normal. Um, this is our step two is everybody is the new hotness. Mm-hmm. When you notice that like, reflexive judgment that happens in your body, when you see a person out in the world, notice that and just be like, oh, right. That was the brainwashing of the bikini industrial complex. And she is the new hotness. She is beautiful exactly as she is. She was beautiful on the day she was born and some loving adult held her body and called her perfect and beautiful. That was all true about her body then. And it's all true about her body right now, just as it's true about my body right now. I'm the new hotness. Hotness. She is the new hotness. You're the new hotness. We are all the new hotness. This takes a lot of practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still get those reflexive flashes of judgment, and I just, I just notice them. Like, oh, hello, brainwashing. You are not yet completely undone. That person is the new hotness, right? And that's now. We, I know you also have the Mad Woman in the Attic from the book The Inner Critic, which yes, we all have. But is that can we counter the Mad Woman in the Attic with new hotness response? The mad woman in the attic is the voice of the inner critic. Her job is to bridge the gap, nay, chasm, between the world as it 
uh, what the world expects us to be, who the world expects us to be, and who we actually are. So if it's um, one of the things that the world expects us to be is thin, mm -hmm. then the mad woman in the attic, yeah, her job is to say, if you are not thin, you will not fit in and no one will ever love you and you will die alone. That's what the mad woman in the attic says. And she is a mad woman mm -hmm. and she is wrong, but she is trying to protect you. And that self-critical voice um, there's a lot of sort of general advice in the world that mm -hmm. says you should just, you should shut that down and ignore mm -hmm. that voice. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine if you were trying to yell at someone to keep them safe because you really believed they were in danger and they just ignored you? That would be enraging. So what we suggest is what you would want someone to do if you were yelling at them because you thought they were in danger, which is to turn to that voice and say, hey, what? why are you yelling at me? You think I'm in danger. I, I hear you. Thank you for trying to protect me. I understand that you think that this is true, but guess what? Nope. We don't have to conform to the culturally constructed ideal. Uh, we can be safe and we can be loved and we can be healthy and happy just as we are. Thanks for your, you know, trying to keep me safe. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually I'm the, I'm the grown adult here and I am taking care of myself and I'm going to be fine. Yeah. And I think so many people, when they're just starting to, to, practice self-compassion and kindness that to even differentiate like your inner caregiver voice from your inner critic voice is, is a step like, you know, so how you're talking about identifying her as a person who really cares about your well-being, but isn't really saying the helpful stuff. It's, there's, it's so important to create that separation because otherwise it feels like your identity, right? And like you're fighting with yourself and that feels hard for people. That's actually why we recommend people really like sit and think about like a persona mm -hmm. for this mean voice in their head, this inner critic. We turn her into a mad woman, find out where she came from. When did you first hear from her? I think I was probably around 11 when she popped up in my head. Um, what's her origin story? What is she afraid of? Like, what does she need? Because when we figure out who our mad women are, they're these unpleasant people nearly always, but underneath the unpleasantness is this vulnerability and sadness and fear and usually exhaustion because she is, she does care and she is trying and she has an impossible job of trying to close the gap between who you actually are and who the world expects you to be. That gap cannot be closed. And her job is to close it. You'd be crazy too if that were your job, <laughs> right? Like, so mm -hmm. no wonder, like I can have compassion and empathy for her situation. That doesn't mean I have to believe her, but I can, I, so, okay. So here's my example. I, um, I had this conference in my calendar for Sunday morning. It was in my calendar. And then Saturday morning, I get a text. Hey, Emily, are you uh, upstairs? We're ready to get started. Ah, no, that's a nightmare. <laughs> oh my God. Did that happen? Yes. <gasps> and she made that sound. Yes, that's exactly. exactly <laughs> Amelia was in the room when this happened. Yes. Uh, like I was easily an hour away from where I needed to be in order to get there. Like it was just not going to happen. I fucked up very badly <laughs> in like a nightmare kind of like a nightmare kind of way. And of course, my mad woman starts like my mad woman is uh, Teka from Moana, the lava Ooh, monster. Yeah. So she starts throwing lava <laughs> balls at me like you have failed. So I take my own advice from the book. I like sit quietly. I turn toward the lava monster who is enraged at me. And I ask her, like, talk to me. Tell me what's going on for you. I have crossed the horizon to find you. <laughs> <laughs> I know your name. Moana does this too. She's like, I, I'm not afraid of you. They have stolen the heart from inside you. It's not her fault that she's crazy. But this does, does not, not defy you. you. <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> that was less than 15 seconds. Absolutely fair use. <laughs> so, uh, so I turned toward her and she starts telling me how like when I make these errors, people are going to hate me and resent me and realize I'm not a professional. I have no idea what I'm doing <laughs> and I'm going to die alone, literally. And when I can listen with kindness and compassion in this way, literally like Moana turning toward 
Teka holding, she's holding Teka's heart Mm -hmm. in the palm of her hand. We hold the heart of our own worst enemy right there in the palm of our hand. And if we can turn toward her with kindness and compassion, she will start telling us like what my lava monster started telling me, which is not just that I was going to die alone, but how afraid she was for me, how important it was for me that she keep me safe and how tired she was from working so hard all the time to make the world think that I am, you know, perfect. Not that the world thinks that, but like working so hard to put on a show Mm -hmm. to make it seem like I never make mistakes. And I could like, I had this sense of like, I am like turning towards you with your heart. And it does turn out if no one has, if you haven't seen Moana, I am about to spoil it. (laughs) She turns into Tefiti, the Mm -hmm. goddess of life itself. If we can turn with kindness and compassion toward our inner critic, it turns out she is the ultimate source of abundance and creativity and power and love. Ultimately, that's my relationship with my mad woman. And like, it takes work and I'm not like, it's not like I do this 100% of the time, but when you can manage it, it's incredibly powerful. Amelia's experience of her mad woman is totally different from mine, though. Well, now uh, I have to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my mad woman is, I see an image of two sort of like throbbing black dust bunnies, like a big giant one that's sort of looming over the little one. And there's a kind of vertiginous pull. And I experience in my body a sense of vertigo of like my my size changing relative to the space that I'm in. Um, sort of like the, the what's it called? The pull zoom that Alfred Hitchcock does. Dolly zoom. Dolly zoom, where he zooms in at the same time as pulling the camera away. Mm-hmm. Um, so the person stays the same size, but the background changes relatively differently. I, I have that physical sensation and sort of a vision of that, of, of these two little squiggles. <laughs> <laughs> so what I do when I experience that is it's information to me. And that's what tells me that I... Uh, I need to sit down and pay attention to what's happening around me. Yeah, but you're able you're able to neutralize it as information, right? So to take yes. it from a judgment to, hey, this is information that I think could help me. Yes. Before I understood it in terms of it being this sort of mad woman experience, uh, it would shut me down. I would feel I would it would make me feel physically ill, and I would feel like I couldn't do any more things. Mm-hmm. And now that I know that it's, oh, uh, for, so now when I've experienced that sensation, I consciously turn toward it and I say, oh, that's the mad woman. That's the information that my failure means that I'm going to die alone. And that's actually not true. And the physical sensation stops. I feel better right away. I go from a state of feeling like achy and exhausted to being completely fine again, instantly. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Well, I want to try to sum up uh, my understanding of of what we discussed. Um, And of course, all the listeners are going to go and buy burnout and work on the tools and go through the whole experience themselves. That is really the most important next step. Um, But ultimately, burnout is real. There's a lot of historical and cultural construct for what makes us struggle with burnout. And often in today's society, we just feel that it's a personal responsibility thing and you should be able to handle it. And, you know, that creates a whole other level of of shame. And what we're trying to do is help people understand that we can take an action on the stress uh, cycle by co- committing to completing it. And those are the things that we might think about as self-care, which is totally new for me to find out the origins of the word self-care. So thank you for that. And that's also a part of privilege. That meme that everybody shares that just overly simplifies that. Like yeah. you don't do that in burnout. You tell it like it is and you talk about big complicated issues but also wonderful stories. I related, I forget her name now, but the squatty potty friend who had to bow train her. I had to do that. Julie. Yes, yes did Julie. You? I did. I, I we, got we know many, and we know The reason that story is there because of how many women we know have gone through a similar experience. Totally. Yep. Yeah. 
I love my squatty potty now. And I, but I, but I had the bathroom practice 10 minutes, three times mm-hmm. a day. Wow. Um, so anyway, it really is. So <laughs> there's that story and many other good ones, but just what I want listeners to, to get out of this conversation and, and to expect with the book is that you are going to hear from intelligent writers the topic is very well researched. It is, I'm a science nerd too. This is science-based and it still gives you practical stuff that you can take meaningful action on. And it's it's not going to sell you short on the, you know, okay, this is hard and then just smile and wash your face and it'll all be fine, right? This is mm-hmm. not that kind of a book. It really goes there in the things that we can and can't control but also does give you a better sense of meaning and purpose so that, and even how we ended on the, um, the like, of how to deal with our mad woman, I think it's almost relating to kind of where we're at and what is sort of typical manageable stress and rolling with it and so that we can better know ourselves, right, when it gets overwhelming, that we have better yes. tools of dealing with it. Exactly. Awesome. Any other remaining tips or motivations or anything that we may have not covered? No, we're just totally in love with you. I want to marry you now because you explained our book so perfectly. <laughs> I accept. I accept this proposal. They'll be Yay. singing. Yay. They'll be singing in orgasms. This is a perfect marriage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, burnout's available everywhere. Books are sold. And um, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. We did not plan that. (laughs) (laughs) It's a twin thing. (laughs) And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash body kindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook search Body Kindness and request to join the group for Body Kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.